Our next speaker, Benjamin Baumhardt, is the co-founder of Draglet. Uh, he became increasingly involved in trading cryptocurrencies and saw the potential in this technology and the possible changes attached to it, and co-founded Draglet, Draglet, a corporation in Munich that develops, tests, and operates a cryptocurrency exchange software as a white-label solution for customers around the world. And, uh, Benjamin will be telling us all about how the technology that drives currency exchange is evolving. Please welcome Benjamin Baumhardt. Hello there. Thank you very much for the introduction. I have never been introduced by Andreas. It is sure a honor. Also, it is a honor to be here to be able to speak in such a high-profile speaker setup. Um, yeah, I would say let's jump into the matter right now. Let's start with the agenda so you have an idea what we are going to talk about. Um, we are going to start with a short introduction who I am. Then we are going to go into this generation zero, which in my eyes is the early start of exchanging. From that point on, we are going to have a look at each generation. We are going to have a look at the challenge each generation had. We are going to have a look at what lessons learned we can pull out of those generations, and also how new generations are being formed. When we arrive at the fourth generation, you will have some overview of the recent development in the exchange environment, and also I will give you a short outlook where the journey might be headed to in terms of Bitcoin exchanges. First of all, we have to start with a small disclaimer because it is only my own observations. Also, it can be understood in, uh, more as a trend of uh, how exchanges developed over the time, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the second generation is always better than the first generation. So, on the left side, I don't know if it's uh, anyhow uh, viewable. Um, There's an old photograph of mine. Back then, I had a different hairstyle. I'm eight, um, 32 years old, I'm from Munich, Germany, which is uh, 11,000 miles or 18,000 kilometers away from Queenstown. I hold a master's in virtual informatics, which is mainly the uh, business informatics or information system and management, and I also hold a master's in international business and enterprise from UK. As time changed, my hair hairstyle also changed, so um, I started to getting into Bitcoin in early 2013 where I started to trade. I bought at 18 and sold at 12, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm also a sales director of Draglet, which is a wide level exchange. I'm going to tell you something about it later on. And I'm also a member of the German chapter of Bitcoin Foundation. So let us start with an overview. What is an exchange? The definition of exchange is an act of giving one thing and receiving another, especially of the same kind in return. In this case, it does mean that users can change Bitcoin to fiat and vice versa. In this case, it does mean it is the opportunity to enter and exit the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, early 2009 to end of 2010, do you think there was any exchange going on? And in, if yes, no, why is it so? Who of you thinks there was immense trading going on? Hands up. Perfectly right. If you have a look at the price, which was uh, in the mid of, or at the end of 2010, it was like five cents per Bitcoin, which is nothing. So why would you exchange something that hasn't any value at all? And also can be mined easily, so it doesn't make any sense to register on an exchange. You can mine your Bitcoins easily yourself. So when Bitcoin exchange happen, happened, when did, or where, where did it happen? So it's happened mostly on social networks that allowed the registration of um, the users and also user authentication. And uh, this was, for example, Internet Relay Chat or Bitcoin Talk, the biggest or, yeah, the forum when it comes to Bitcoins. And it was also based on trust systems or escrow. You can see um, an overview of how this escrow or this trust system looked like. Here you can see a list of users that have been using the Bitcoin OTC, the trade channel, to trade Bitcoins versus fiat money. And you can see the most active person has around 780 trades. Um, as far as I know, he is also um, the person that made this uh, over-the-counter trade happen in the um, Internet Relay channel. And this is what I think is the generation zero, because this, this were the early starts of Bitcoin trading, and they also had some challenges. 
for example, the process was very inconvenient because it was manually done. You had to take care that you, haven't, that you won't be scammed. So the chances of getting scammed was definitely there. And as a result, it wasn't a very good way to enter or exit the Bitcoin economy. So what are we going to do now? We are going to have an example, the pizza trade. Who of you have heard uh, of the pizza trade? Hands up. Most of you, if not all, yeah. Let's just um, have a look at the pizza trade. In May 2010, the user Laszlo from Bitcoin Talk Forum was looking for a real value for his Bitcoin. So he was asking for a person that is going to pay for his pizza and he, in exchange, will get 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas. Nowadays, the Bitcoin for this pizza would be worth 3.7 million US dollars which I think is the most expensive pizza ever sold. And what you can learn of this first generation, or of, of the serious generation, sorry, when we are trying to form the first generation, we need some automatization for the escrow, which is the order matching from an exchange point of view. We also need a trustworthy entity that allows users to, to uh, you know, go into the harbor and make some safe exchanges. And also, we need some sort of central point of access because exchange back then in the, f in the zero generation was more or less gathered around, um, amongst those uh, Bitcoin talk from IRC channels and whatnot. So if you have a, a look at the timeline, 2009, in January, Bitcoin was born. In February 2010, the first exchange Bitcoin markets went live. And even three months after the first exchange went online, the pizza deal happened, so it does also show us that those first generation exchanges were not the best way to go. And um, yeah, Empty Gox is also a very good example. I think everybody knows Empty Gox. Um, let us dive into that matter. Originally, Magic the Gathering online exchange. It was an exchange that was used for trading player cards from Magic the Gathering game. It was then modified to be able to handle Bitcoin transactions and it did 80 to 90% of all transactions back then in the old days. They had some severe problems in terms of legal problems. In January 12th, the banking problem started. In May 13, 2 million US dollars have been seized by the US Fed. In May 2013, they have been sued by CoinLab on a higher scale. And um, August 2013, five million, another 5 million US dollars have been seized by the Feds again. And this had some severe impact on how the exchange was operating. You can see in July 13, the fiat withdrawal already took 1.5 months. And in September 13, it took 22 months, which is a very long time. Okay, and you can also see some, some effects on the transaction volume. You can see that MTGOX was mainly responsible for the trading that took place. Thank you, by the way, Brave Nikon, for uh, giving me that market data. And um, you can see that from the point of time that the fiat withdrawal were starting to get delayed, the transaction volume really went down a lot. And also the price had some problems. So what people tried to do, trying to get the liquidity from empty Gox, they had to buy bitcoins and transact those bitcoins through the wallet address. This was the only opportunity to get liquidity out of the system. And you can see there was some price deviation going on from, from the time that the fiat withdrawals were delayed. And this got even worse when the Bitcoin withdrawal on MTGOX got delayed or even completely disabled. And you can see um, MTGOX always had a premium between 10 and 20% in comparison to other exchanges. And from the point of time the Bitcoin withdrawal were disabled, it went down and the party was over. So we have some challenges in the first generation. The problem of the first generation was they were absolute pioneers. There was nothing they could use as some sort of template. So what they had also, um, they were not sure about the legal circumstances because regulation back then was even more unsure than it is today. Because even today there are countries where the regulation of Bitcoin is not very certain right now. And um, also they had a very immature technology that, that made them very weak 
in terms of downtimes, user account losses, and um, of course operational weaknesses. If any of you guys were trading on, on MT Gox, I, I'm pretty sure you can remember downtimes of hours or even days where no trading was available. And also hacks and exploits was a big problem of MT Gox back then. I think that MT Gox was reporting 150,000 hacks per second. We don't know if this figure is right, but um, it is definitely a tremendous figure and it shows how much attacks might come on a Bitcoin exchange. So we now know what the challenges of the first generation was or were, so now we are trying to form the second generation. We know exchanging is basic and we also know the market gets a little bit tight. In the first generation, there were only a few alternatives for traders available, so there wasn't a big choice to, to, to be done. But um, when the second generation came into play, there were more alternatives. So the exchanges really needed some unique selling propositions to get customers for trading on their exchange. And uh, this might also be done with, for example, add-ons. And we also have some examples for the second generation. For example, MCX Now was one of the first exchanges that featured the trading of altcoins. And also they had um, a trading fee dividend. They, they took 25% of the transaction fee that was being done of this transaction platform. And they were, this was distributed as a dividend for users that stored bitcoins on MCX Now, which is a nice way to go because um, I think this is some sort of approach that has been sort of unique up to now even. Another example is Bitcoin24.com, which was not that big exchange, but they had a bigger euro transaction volume than empty Gox. So th this was because they had instant deposits, they also had 0% trading fee, and they had also no KYC. Some regulators might grinch their teeth right now, but for a user it was a perfect way to get into the game to get uh, registered, to get not KYC, because this is usually a process that takes between one and two weeks, at least it took this time back then, when empty Gox, for example, operated. And um, of course, the second generation also had his, uh, its problems. For example, Bitcoin24.com, um, on the license or on the legal part, they didn't have a license for operating their exchange. Furthermore, the technology they used had an order matching bug, which was a very interesting thing because it worked the following way. You could just deposit one Bitcoin on Bitcoin24.com. Now you had to wait until some high frequency trading was going on because it was, it was known that this exchange was having um, a small problem with the order matching. As, as far or as soon as a high frequency trading is being done, the order matching has real severe bugs. For example, you sell one Bitcoin in an unlimited order, you get three times the sale price. What you do then, you buy three Bitcoin with a limited order, sell them again with an unlimited order, so we have nine Bitcoin. And you can repeat this game until you're rich, and in the end, you just withdraw all Bitcoin, and the other exchange users are the one that lost all the money. In April 2013, those bugs occurred because we had the, the second price spike. And also, the, the German and Polish authorities simultaneously closed the banking accounts of Bitcoin24 in Poland and Germany, which is a nice way to go because the, all the liquidity was gone and on, on the Bitcoin side and also on the Euro side. So this exchange was definitely dead from this point of time on. So now we are forming the third generation. The exchanging is basic but needs really to be safe, as we could see at the Bitcoin24 example. Um, we need some sort of maturity of software and also no one-man show. It is very interesting to see that one exchange operated by one person, like it was the case at Bitcoin24.com, can succeed in terms of having more transaction volume in the euro side than MT Gox. It is a very interesting example. And also we need um, additional security precautions like uh, two-factor authentication to further um, increase the security for your user funds. Second of all, you need to be a trustworthy legal entity as an operator. 
for example, this can be done with auditability or transparency and also having a license for what you're doing. When you're forming the third generation, we can see that Bitcoin 24 was a very, very uh, young exchange. They started in early 2012. MCX now was starting a little bit later in August 2012. <coughs> Excuse me. And in April 2013, a study came out that said that 45% of all Bitcoin exchanges end up closing down within the first year, which is very interesting. And um, I think that Kraken is a very good example of um, how exchanges can work because they knew transparency and auditability is one of the main uh, points how you can create a trust for your customers. I think um, this third generation right now is doing very well. I can only point out the problems or the challenges that they have. For example, the legal implications are that the circumstances are changing, so the legal framework might change. There might be a new regulation coming tomorrow and might endanger your Bitcoin business. And for example, um, KYC AML nowadays is, in my eyes, a complete must in order to enable a sustainable operation of your exchange. So we don't only have the legal implications, we, only, uh, we also have further technical developments that are taking place in the Bitcoin industry. For example, the multi-dignature approach is something that came up uh, more or less recently and has to be implemented in the exchange software in order to be able to uh, secure the user funds and also there are loads of old kinds, uh, old kinds coming out every day and um, it is also important to track those old coins and then at the, at the end of the day implement the steam and try to get it running on your exchange. And I see on both sides a very high workload to be done in order to be safe as a Bitcoin exchange. So if you could learn something out of the third generation and if you're trying to form a fourth generation, you have two parts. One is the legal operational part, and the other part is the technological part. So what is, is a logical conclusion in my eyes? You form a cooperational structure between the legal operational and the technological part. So you have an exchange operator which is doing the legal and operational part, and the technological service provider that assists um, assist the exchange operator with a white labeled exchange software. So what do you have as advantage from that? You have a risk distribution amongst both parties. You also have a better scalability and you have a very, very nice time to market. Six, six minutes, seven minutes, perfect. So um, when having a look um, of the activities that each uh, customer does in, in case of Draglet, our customers have to market the exchange so driving campaigns, making people come towards this exchange. They also have to follow some sort of business development. They need to keep track of the exchange performance. They need to work out plans how they can even grow their business more. They need to provide support and also compliance in terms of KYC, AML, and of course, the license for operating the exchange. What we are going to do then, we are going to set up and customize the exchange according to the customer's branding and CI. We are also going to uh, further develop the exchange software according to the customer's needs. We are going to give him some reliable B2B support and, of course, server maintenance to ensure availability of the exchange. There are quite a lot of white label exchanges out there. For example, Vorum, AlphaPoint, and Buttercoin are, are our American friends. Americans are always the first on the market. BTC Trader was uh, the first European attempt for white label. We also have a Bex.io from Canada. I'm not pretty sure if they are still following the white label exchange business. Draglet was uh, founded in 2013 late, so we are not even the youngest white label uh, exchange. You can see that Cryptonext from the Isle of Man has been the recent uh, white label exchange. And uh, when talking about Draglet, what's different about Draglet compared to our competitors, we have a, a fully modular exchange software, we have an admin interface which allows you to administer all markets, to administer the port and uh, withdraw request. We have a solid order matching engine with a so-called optimistic fund locking feature. We have a crypto wallet with an encrypted user access. 
we have um, a scalable distributed server architecture and we also have a responsive client interface that allows the customers to go on your exchange. This means that we have extendable and customized models that can be used as strategic base for further business development. Um, when talking about other differences to competitors, our software was really built from the scratch. We have this feature called optimistic fund locking, which is unique. There isn't any exchange out there that has also these features. We just heard uh, that software patterns are not that good. Uh, I think it can be seen on, on different per 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 perspectives. Um, <laughs> Um, we um, already applied for our uh, first software patent for our encrypted user access, which is, um, secures user funds from external and in-house attacks. Um, we are also the only white label exchange that has been bootstrapped right now. Um, all our competitors have uh, huge investment capitals behind them, but we are the only one that can offer reliable service level agreements, which in my eyes are the most important factors when there is a technological service provider, you need to have some contractual agreements. And um, from December 2014 on, we will introduce our new TIX pricing as only pricing. This is also very different from our competitors. Our competitors charge between 30 and 50% of all transaction volume. We don't charge a single percent. We just want uh, that uh, the exchange operator can buy transactions in the bulk and then use those ticks for uh, matching transactions on the exchange. And also, another important factor of white label exchanges is, is the, the uh, shared liquidity thingy. So you can connect external exchanges to your exchange to pull back um, orders from other order books and fill your fresh order book, which is the most important negative networking effect that might occur when you start an exchange. So let's go with the outlook. I think we're going to see a lot of more merging trading platforms because the success of 796.com or Bitfinex is a good sign that this is definitely working. I think we are going to see more altcoin specific exchanges because the development of uh, altcoins isn't going to slow down. I think we might have, I don't know, 1,000 altcoins in the very near future. So there is going to be a flood of exchanges, and this means for the customer that has to choose from the exchange he wants to trade on, there is going to be a competition of trading fees that will make, um, if you are a user and you want to, to make um, a decision which exchange you are trading on, you, the only quantitative opportunity to compare exchanges is the transaction fee. And I think this is the main reason why the transaction fee is going to go to zero and maybe some decentralized exchanges, we can see that um, asset-backed or um, counterparty um, asset exchanges are going to go bigger, and um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing those decentralized exchange thing. I think that's from my side. We can go to the questions and ask a part. Thank you very much for your attention. A yeah, quick question about terminology. You mentioned uh, the, the term white label. Can you explain what that is? A white label? Um, white label means that you are a service provider and uh, you will give someone a service or a software solution and the customer that will use the solution won't notice that the original operator isn't the one that is the service deliverer. So if we are going to, to uh, get an exchange, a white label exchange online, the customers trading on this exchange won't even know it's a draglet exchange. They will just be the branding of the legal operator. Hi, um, can you tell us what optimistic forward locking is? Optimistic fund locking, thanks a lot for asking. When you register on an exchange, you have zero account balance. So you're not allowed to create an order. This leads to the fact that if you want to enter the Bitcoin economy, you have to register on the exchange. Then you have to start the wire transfer. And as soon as the wire transfer hits the account of the exchange and your account balance is being updated, you are allowed to start trading. But you don't know when will the wire transfer hit your banking account or the banking account of the exchange operator. So what we thought when building our software from the scratch, um, why not allow people to create orders although they have no account balance? 
So what you can do with the Draglet software, you can register on the, on the Draglet exchange, you can create an order, although you have, you have no account balance available, but it will be set in a post mode, not being shown in the order book for obvious reasons, but as long as your account balance gets updated, your order will be automatically executed. And there are a few scenarios that will increase the convenience of, of trading. Thanks. So one of the advantages that the current stock market has is liquidity. And that's because a stock like Apple trades on one exchange and then you have 100 brokers competing for speed of execution, functionality, fees. Um, so what is the idea for a future exchange where all the Bitcoins are coming from one pool, where a single exchange like Bitfinex can't scare the market because they have a margin call? And then all these exchanges are basically competing on execution and platform and things like that, but then we run into the same problem that Andreas mentioned. Now all the Bitcoins are in one pool and that creates a different kind of a problem. Yeah, there are problems on, on both ends, um, I think, but um, I think we need to increase the liquidity because if a big investor is moving into Bitcoin, there needs to be liquidity in order to, to keep the price stable. Um, I think there is not only one way to increase liquidity. For example, we are trying to work on a really shared order book amongst all draglet exchanges. So um, you can say, I want to connect my exchange to an exchange in draglet exchange in uh, Singapore, for example. You can set some trust level. I trust this exchange for 5,000 euros, for example. And you can remotely match orders, not only on your exchange, but um, also on other exchanges. Yeah. But you're right, there are also problems when trying to connect external liquidity, like um, frequency problem, delays problems, so the order matching gets sort of confused, but um, right now I think we can, we can handle this problem. Thank you, Thank you very much.